sheep. If he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine and go to the country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. That is the love of God. Some call it reckless. Some call it unimaginable. Some call it indescribable. The point is, God's love for us is so great that he gave his son for us. When Jesus went to the cross, he was being obedient to the will of God the Father. He took upon himself that which was not his, which was our sin. And he gives us that which is not ours. That's his righteousness. Let's read this verse together in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, this is the love that lifts us up from our sin. Psalm 41 and 2 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock. Making my steps secure. Well, let's sing together.
love that God's love for us is God's love that lifted us out of the mire, clay, out of sin, and then our love back to Jesus. And so those two really go together. Uh, if you've experienced his love for you, then you ought to be loving him back in return. And that's not just on Sunday morning when we come together to worship, but every day, every moment is a gift from God. And we need to express our love for him for those moments. Uh, again, we're glad that you're with us this morning. And uh, we trust that God's going to use this time to encourage your heart. Uh, some, some people have asked me about, since we don't have bulletins, and uh, we're looking at when we can start that back, but uh, since we don't have bulletins, could we acknowledge uh, the, when the flowers are placed in the sanctuary? And so uh, I wanted to do that this morning. We'll try to remember every week. Um, if I forget to do that some week and you put the flowers, wave at me or something, let me know, remind me uh, that I need to, uh, to, to, to mention that. So the flowers today are placed in memory of Trey Upchurch, and uh, they're placed by his parents, Sheila and Ralph Bradshaw. So uh, thank you, Sheila and Ralph, for these beautiful flowers. Let's go to the Lord now in a word of prayer as we uh, continue uh, our time of worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful that you loved us and that you demonstrated that love by sending your son to die on the cross to take our sin upon himself. And Lord, we know that he didn't deserve that because he was sinless. But out of love, your love for us, his love for us, he did that. And we can experience forgiveness of our sin and demonstrate our love back to you. So I pray, Father, that uh, we would do exactly that, that we would recognize your love for us and then show you our love for you. Lead us now through this time of worship and study and prayer and learning. Uh, let your spirit guide us through these moments. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
sort of person and can't go out of that. And so this morning, I think we've got to get in our minds and know He is a God of revival who desires revival within each other's person. And even the darkest things we go through, that psalm says, that scripture says, to the evil of our God. So this morning, I want to challenge you just the next moment to examine yourself. Scripture tells us to examine ourselves. Where is it that the Lord needs to prune you? Where that light needs to shine through? Where that scripture, the sharper than the two-edged sword, needs to come in and needs to do work in each of us personally for personal life? That's what he's asking this morning. So as we continue to sing, just ask the Lord to reveal that to you in these next moments. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And in the parable of the prodigal son, which actually begins in the very next verse, Jesus told of a son who went to his father and asked for his share of the inheritance. The son went out, leaving his father and his family. And because of bad choices, he lost everything that he had been given. And later on, desperate, the son not having anything or anywhere to go. He came back to his father, begging for his father to take him back and, and at least just make him one of his hired servants. Beginning in verse 21 of Luke 15, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring and put it on his hand, and put shoes on his feet. Bring the fat calf and kill it. Let us eat and let us celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. 
He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. So this is a picture of grace. The father loving his son so much that no matter what the son had done wrong, the father joyfully welcomed him back, forgiving him. See, this is what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. He went to the cross. He paid the price for our sins so that we can repent. We can ask for forgiveness of our sins knowing that the price has already been paid. And we are welcomed back. And we are forgiven. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. As we sing together this next song, Grace to Grace, followed by the old hymn, Jesus Paid It All, I hope it will be a time of personal worship for you. A time you either reflect on the grace that, that was given by our Lord through his sacrifice to you. Or a time of repentance and turning to Christ to receive that grace. As we worship this morning, you can stand, you can remain seated. It's just you and the Lord.
Isaiah 54, 17 tells us this. It says, in the coming day that no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. And it ends the verse this way, that I, the Lord, have spoken. Whatever battle you face, victory comes through the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. And we just get to enjoy the victory. We get to be part of the process, but the victory's already been won. Let's sing this song real quick. Oh, you
tries to do to us, and yet you take that and you work it for our good, just like your word says, all things work out for our good when we know you and we are serious about following your purpose for our lives. And so we thank you for that kind of love for us, that kind of attention to our needs. You go before us, you stand behind us, you walk beside us. You are the God who meets our needs and provides for us. And we worship you. Help us to hear the word that you have for our hearts today now, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. During the uh, era of silent movies, before there was sound uh, in the movies, uh, Charlie Chaplin was, was one of the, the mo most uh, famous stars of that era. Uh, his favorite role was to dress like the tramp. And he would put on shabby clothes and a little funny hat, and he had a cane, and he would waddle around and shuffle around, and um, all this was silent. There was no, no sound, no words on the screen, but uh, he became a superstar. And everybody flocked to the movies to see Charlie Chaplin uh, go through his routines. Uh, he became so popular that they began to have Charlie Chaplin look-alike contests around the country. And so uh, people would sign up, guys would sign up uh, to be a contestant in these look-alike contests, and the judges would determine which one of the guys that were shuffling around the stage looked most like Charlie Chaplin. Well, one time Chaplin himself decided to enter one of the contests. And so he showed up at a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest, didn't identify himself, used a false name, and entered the contest. The interesting thing is that Charlie Chaplin didn't even make the finals in his own look-alike contest. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes people don't recognize the real thing even if it's staring them right in the face. And that's often the way it is with God's children. Those who believe in Christ. Many people don't see God's children for who they are. Don't recognize who they represent. And some of God's children themselves don't know for sure who they are. That's because we're all human and sometimes life is a struggle. And we, we get sidetracked. And things get messed up. We sin. And we know that in my current situation right now, God can't be very happy with me. And so I, I don't think I can look much like God right now. But sometimes God's children think they are stuck where they are and they have to continue in that life when they know that's not the life God wants them to live. That's not who they are. It's not who they want to be. But they don't know what to do about it. They seem to be stuck where they are instead of living what they know they should be living. And... That may describe you today. I don't know. You may be wondering, how can I get back to what I know God wants for me? How, how can I overcome my sin and, and become all that God wants me to be? I want to look like Him. Because I know that's what He wants for me. This morning, I... I want to offer you some encouragement as we consider what it means to be a child of God, what it means to look like God. And we're going to start this morning with 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. Uh, we're working through uh, John's little letter uh, to the churches. Uh, it's part of the January Bible study, and 
If you want one of the little study books, there's some out here at the sign-up table. Uh, we got some more in this week. And so uh, we won't be having the evening studies, but you can follow through. Uh, we're going chapter by chapter in the morning sermons, and the little book will be helpful to you as well if you'll read and study uh, that little book. But uh, we're going to be in chapter 3 today, but we'll start with the last verse of chapter 2. <clears throat> First John 2, 29 says, If you know that he, God, is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now, I want you to understand, he uses this phrase, practice of righteousness. Uh, and, and this phrase... Uh, cannot come, this, this, self, this uh, practice of righteousness cannot come from your own self-effort. You, of your own accord, cannot practice righteousness. Romans 3.10 reminds us, there are none who are righteous, no, not even one. And so if none of us are righteous, how can we practice Righteousness. Living right, doing what's right. How can we be righteous? Well, uh, I think this verse uh, tells us. It, it comes as a result of being born of God. It's right there in the verse. Uh, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Or you can't live a righteous life, life unless you are born of Him. When you trust Christ in your life, the Bible says that you are born again. You are born into a new family. You become a part of God's family. You're a child of God. And that means that the DNA of God then comes into your life and you become righteous in His eyes. As a result of having God's DNA flow through your veins, then you can practice righteousness. It's not yours because none of us are righteous. But when God comes into our lives, we can practice His righteousness. Before accepting Christ, you could only practice sin because the DNA of the natural man is sinful. But now as a child of God, you can practice righteousness. Not of your own accord, not of your own effort, but because you have been born of his blood. And he has given you a transfusion of his DNA. And you then can practice righteousness. So if you want to overcome sin and become all that God wants you to be, you have to know who you are. You have to acknowledge and recognize who you are. We're going into chapter 3 now. 1 John 3, 1 tells us who we are in Christ. See what kind of love the Father has given to us? That we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Now, when Charlie Chaplin walked across that stage, the judges didn't recognize him because they didn't really know Charlie Chaplin. But listen, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're no longer just a mere mortal. People won't recognize you if they don't know him. You become a child of God. And because of that, people don't know, who don't know Christ don't understand who you are. People who don't have that DNA of God in their lives won't recognize you who do. But it doesn't really matter what people see when they look at you because our Heavenly Father sees you as His child. People may not recognize it. And they may not appreciate it, but that is what you are if you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior. You are a child of God. You need to know who you are today. So believe it. 
count on it. Appreciate the fact that you are a child of God who is dearly loved by your Father. And then you can overcome any temptation, any sin, and become all that God wants you to be. In his book, Delighting in the Trinity, Michael Reeves talks about two ways to look at God. This is really interesting. Uh, there, there are people who can view God as the supreme ruler of the universe. And for those who only have that perspective, you know, God's the, the ruler of the universe. I'll give him that. Then the relationship that you can have with that God uh, is not much different than the relationship you might have with the highway patrol. Uh, if, if a highway patrolman catches you speeding and pulls you over, uh, he could punish you for breaking the speed limit and give you a ticket. But if he didn't see you, or if he stops you and just gives you a warning, lets you off, you might be relieved and grateful that you didn't get a ticket, but you wouldn't love him for that. You wouldn't say, oh, I love that highway patrol because he didn't give me a ticket. No, you said, well, he let me go this time, or he didn't catch me. And so it is with this idea of God being the divine policeman. If salvation simply means that God lets you off without giving you a ticket for breaking the rules, then relief and gratitude is all you have. If you just look at God as being that cosmic cop that's giving tickets for people who do wrong because they sin, then you will never experience who God really is. But Reeves goes on to say the picture changes entirely if you view who God actually is. He is the most kind and loving Father that has ever existed. He does have rules and expectations for His children, but He expresses Himself from a position of love and care for each child. See, that's the difference. The cop who's watching to see if he can catch you doing something wrong and punish you for it, or the loving Father who lovingly guides you through life so that you don't get caught up in those things that will cause you problems. Those are two views that you can have of God. So what's your view? How do you look at God? Is he just that cosmic cop who issues tickets for those who break the rules? Or is he your father and you are his child? Your perspective of who God is makes a real difference on, on how you relate to him. And it makes a difference in how you view your own life. When you see God as a divine policeman, then you go through life trying not to get caught. But when you see him as your loving heavenly father, then you go through life wanting to please him. And that's why you don't sin. Not because you don't want to get caught sinning, but because you know your Heavenly Father who loves you does not want you to. A totally different way of looking at God. So it's important for you to know who you are. And you also have to know what you will be in the future. Uh, listen to the next verse, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because he has seen him, we have seen him as he is. Right now, you're a child of God if you've accepted Christ as your Savior. But you, but you really can't understand fully. We can't comprehend what we're going to be because we're going to be like Christ. We're not like him yet. We're still sinful humans. But if you'll let him, he'll work on you and proceed with the process of transforming you into what he wants you to be. Romans 8.29 tells us that God our Father is in the process of conforming us to the image of God. It's a process, and God is working on you now. 
In, in uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us, we are, and he uses the present tense there, it's going on right now, we are being transformed into the likeness of uh, him with everlasting and increasing glory. We are being transformed. We are becoming who God wants us to be. None of us is there yet. It's a, it's a lifelong process, and it culminates when we pass from this life into eternal life with Him. The world can't see that. The world can't understand that. The world can't recognize who you are. And yet God knows exactly who you are, where you are, what's going on, where He wants to get you to. Joyce Daughtery, uh, was a, a nurse in Louisville, Kentucky. And, and she traveled to an orphanage in the Ukraine for the purpose of adopting a child. She had all the arrangements were made and it was all, the legalities were all taken care of. It was just a matter of her going there and deciding which child she was going to adopt. And so she got there and she went to the orphanage and they carried her into this room that was full of children. They were all about two years old toddlers. And this room was just full of kids. She was overwhelmed. But then her eye caught Kristen. And she had big, beautiful blue eyes. But that's not what most people saw when they looked at Kristen. What most people saw was this facial tumor, the tumor that she had. The I'm not going to try to say it. You know what I'm talking about. It's a big birthmark, scar. It covered most of her forehead and cut down part of the right side of her face. And so when Joyce looked at, in the room, she saw Kristen. And here's what she said. Kristen's eyes were so alert, I just couldn't stop watching her. There was something special about this child, and that tumor could not hide it. I could have chosen any child that was there to take home with me that day, but I knew that Kristen might never leave that place if she didn't go with me. I could offer her not only a fresh start, but a new life. One of the workers there explained to Joyce, all these children are throwaways in the Ukraine. Most U Ukrainian families are afraid of a child that has any kind of disability. And so when a child is disabled in any way, then the mothers will often take and leave them at an orphanage or simply abandon them in a public place and walk away, never looking back. But Joyce Daughtery saw something in little Kristen. And she chose to take Kristen home to be her daughter. And then a short while later, a few years or so later, surgeons removed that birthmark, that scar. And when the scars began to heal, everything about Kristen changed dramatically. She constantly chattered to her mother, I love you. I love you. I love you. And that's kind of the way it is when God looked at you. You were disfigured by sin and discarded by the world. But God, God saw something in you that nobody else could see. And so he adopted you and you expressed your faith in him. And he gave you a new life in his son, Jesus Christ. And now he's in the process of removing those tumors and those, those 
things that disfigure your life, that sin in your life. Healing those scars to reveal the beauty of Christ in you. He is changing you. And one day, everybody will see who you are. You are a loved child of God. And he's in the process of changing you to become like Christ himself. you got to believe that. And once you believe that that is what's going on, that's the process that's underway in your life, once you believe that, then you've got to live like it. You've got to live like God loves you, like God has adopted you, like God is transforming you, like God wants you to be like him. Our next verse, uh, verse 4, tells us, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. There it is. Sin means to break God's law. It's lawlessness. The next verse tells us, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And that in him there is no sin. You see the process that's going on here. God wants you to be like him. But as long as you live with sin in your life, you can't do it. You can't be what he wants you to do. He wants to take away that sin. And when you trust him as your savior, he not only takes away the penalty for your sin, he takes away the power of sin in your life as well. You don't have to sin anymore. Now, before you knew Christ, you were in bondage to sin. You didn't have a choice but to obey your sinful lusts. Sin was in control. But now that you know Christ, you are no longer in bondage to sin. You can choose to obey God. Sadly, there are those who say they know Christ who continue to choose sin rather than his love. The next verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 6, tells us, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. See, there's a choice. When you choose to abide in Christ, you're not going to keep on sinning because you can't dwell in Christ and live in sin at the same time. You can't one day be one and the next day be the other. If you're not committed to your life in Christ, then you're submitting to your life of sin. But when you stop dwelling in Christ... You fall into sin every time. When you neglect your relationship to the Lord, that's when it happens. You fall into sin. In fact, to neglect your relationship to the Lord is sin. We know from James chapter 4, so whosoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it's sin. And you know that you ought to be working on your relationship with the Lord. If you're saved, you're his child, you ought to be cultivating that relationship. You ought to be doing the things that make that relationship stronger. And if you're not doing it, you know to do it. So that is sin. It's sin not to follow through and do the things you know to do to become who God wants you to be. But you have a choice. You can dwell in sin, or you can dwell in Christ. And everybody is faced with that same choice. I hope that you'll choose to dwell in Christ. But please understand that to dwell in Christ, to abide in Christ, is not something that you do. 
It's something that you be. It's something that you are. It's living your life with a conscious awareness of his presence. And so the closer you get to Christ and the more you abide in him, the less you want sin to be a part of your life. So you move closer to him and move further away from sin. And the closer you get to him, the easier it is for you to say no to the temptations that come into your life. Now let's look at the next verses, verses 7 and 8. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Another way to say that is to, to loosen or untie the devil's work. You see, before you trusted Christ, the, the devil was your father. Uh, he, he tied you up in sin. He complicated your life. And then Jesus came into your life and he untied those knots of sin. And he rendered the devil's work inoperative and ineffective. The, the problem is that too many Christians live like they're still tied up when Christ has set us free. We're free from that bondage of sin. They're kind of living like circus elephants. Don't even have circus elephants anymore, I don't think, but at one time, to train the elephants, they would, uh, when they were small, baby elephants, they would tie a heavy chain around one of their legs. And that chain was a stick connected to a stake driven in the ground. And as hard as that little baby elephant would try, he'd pull and pull, and he could not get away. And gradually, eventually, they just quit trying because they knew they couldn't get away from that chain and that stake. And what would happen then as they became adult elephants, they were trained to believe that they couldn't leave because of that chain. And so once they were trained in that way, didn't even take a heavy chain anymore. They just put something, a rope around their foot. When they felt that around their foot, they stayed in place because they thought that they were bound to that stake. That's the way some believers live their, live their lives. They're still tied to their old habits. They're still tied to the sin that used to control. They are conditioned to believe that they cannot break free and so they have to stay there. And yet nothing, my friend, is further from the truth. If you are a believer, then Jesus Christ has loosened you from those bonds of sin. He untied you from your sins and, and severed that connection with the devil. Satan is no longer your father. God is your father. And we're going to finish up with verses 9 and 10. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Now remember, we've already talked about being a child of God, so if you're born of God, it's talking about you as his child. No one who is born of God makes it a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. But this is evident who are the children of God? And who are the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. The news report of a, a house fire, 1997, the house, the fire spread rapidly through this house in Philadelphia. And 
Liz Chavez got out of the house, but she didn't get her child, 10-day-old baby. And they looked and looked, and the authorities concluded that the blaze had tragically killed and completely consumed this 10-day-old child. Never found a trace of her. The family grieved, eventually moved on. Six years later, Leah Chavez received an invitation to a child's birthday party. And at the party, she noticed one of the other children that had been invited to come to this party. She noticed this little dimple on the child's cheek. And something moved within her and said to her, that's her. That's your baby. That's Delamar. And she pulled her sister aside and she said, look at that child. You see that dimple? That's Delamar. That's my baby. And her sister thought she was going crazy. You can't, that's not your baby. Your baby died in that fire. No, that's her. I can feel it. I can see it. I know that's my baby. And so she had some pretense of uh, calling the child to her and said she thought she had some gum in her hair. And she, she was able to pull out a couple of strands of hair from this child and she took it and had it tested. And sure enough, it was confirmed that that child was Delamar, Liz's baby who th she thought was lost in that fire. And Carolyn Correa was convicted of kidnapping that child and setting a fire that burned that house down. It was discovered the truth and Delamar got to return to be with her real family. Now listen to me. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, your real family is God's family. God is your father. Your DNA defines who you are. And it's not your circumstances that it determines who you are. The seed that comes from your heavenly father has identified your identity. And that's a righteous seed. A seed that's pleasing to God. So choose to live your life like who you are. A loved child of God. You're not there yet. You're not who you're going to be. But continue to live in him and seek his righteousness in your life as you go through that process of becoming more like him every day. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us these moments together, for allowing us to sing your praises and to lift up prayers to you and to hear your, script, your word, your scripture, and to hear this message for our hearts. Help us to recognize who we are in Christ. And we're not who the world thinks we ought to be. In the coming days and months and years, we'll have opportunity to live out our faith, to stand firm and say, I am a child of God. Lead us now in these moments of decision and dedication. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.